Thanks, to everyone, for being here and um, kind of going through this very thorough and detailed day that we're uh, all in on together, looking at data sets and AI and machine learning and how that fits into our kind of social fabric right now. So I'm going to talk about the project that I made for Photographer's Gallery that you walked by uh, when you entered. So this work that's on the media wall downstairs, that's called How Do You See Me? So How Do You See Me is an attempt to get closer to the other that is watching me and that's watching us all the time. We live in a world where we're constantly being looked at, studied, analyzed. Cameras are everywhere. Sitting in my home office preparing this talk, I was being looked at by my computer, as you see in the picture here. Um, meanwhile, my iPad sat on the desk and my phone sat on the bed, both staring up at the ceiling. When I step out of my apartment, surveillance cameras monitor my movements. When I post a picture to social media or accidentally appear in one taken by someone else, algorithms scrutinize my image. I exist in systems in which I don't even have a profile as a kind of data ghost known secondhand uh, as a person pointed to by others. So these systems know a tremendous amount about me, but what do I know about them? How do you see me is my way of looking back and trying to learn how this alien intelligence that is so attentive to my every move is structured internally. And this is, of course, a political act. We're meant to be seen, not to see. Facial recognition is a tool of control, and it's intentionally obscured to make it difficult to comprehend. It's intentionally attractive to make it difficult to resist. I want to take a bit of time to just talk about what facial recognition is and how it works in a little bit of technical detail. Um, and that's because I think that the details matter and that I think that the specificity of the material matters. So a facial recognition system exists in basically two phases of life, one which is a, a training period and one which is a deployment period. And it's the deployment period that we most often think of when we think of these systems that are looking at us and analyzing us and figuring out who we are. Uh, but training is what prepares the model, and that's what we've been mostly talking about here today. We've been talking a lot about training data and data sets. And so this training period has been a lot of the focus of our discussions here today. Um, but deployment is when they're out in the world and being used on us. So training data is a topic that we've been discussing um, here today. Uh, machine learning requires a lot, a lot of data, like millions of examples to work even reasonably well in a kind of real world system. And when we're talking about facial recognition, data means your face. Uh, when it comes to faces, this training data is taken from images of people that are posted online, either by themselves um, or by others, and is almost always taken without consent. So probably the largest facial recognition database in the world is made of our selfies. Facebook has a facial recognition database that's vaster in scope than law enforcement ever could have hoped to assemble. And this is advanced research on facial recognition dramatically because actually what's used are a lot of old algorithms. There's not really a lot of new algorithms uh, going on in the mix here, uh, but what those old algorithms always really needed was a lot more data. And so we've given them that. And this is, of course, a proprietary database that is without public access when we're talking about Facebook. And then another example that I think someone alluded to a little bit earlier here today um, that you might have recently heard about. So Microsoft recently deleted their so-called MS Celeb database, um, or at least deleted the homepage for the database after it was exposed by the designer Adam Harvey with his megapixels uh, project that this set of kind of 10 million images of so-called celebrities, celebrities that consisted of actors, but also prominent journalists, artists, musicians, activists, policymakers, writers, and academics, these public figures, 
Uh, so 10 million images of these public figures that were being used without their permission. And then through this publicly accessible database could be used for any kind of research. So was used, for example, um, in facial recognition uh, by authorities in China, among many, many examples. And this was the largest publicly accessible data set for facial recognition in the world. And um, even though the home page has been taken down, the data is still there because these things never go away. So once you've posted a, a, a data set online, as we heard about earlier with the ImageNet, so even though not all of ImageNet was easily accessible right now, there was still an archive of this that could be found and that could be resurrected. And the same is exactly true for this. So once a data set is put out there, you can never take it back. Um, so it's always copied and changed and mutated. And that's exactly what we have. Um, so you can go on GitHub and easily still access the MS Celeb database. You can also access it as it's been tagged with all kinds of dubious categories like we've been, we're hearing about today. So you can look for images um, categorized by gender, by race, by um, whether someone's wearing glasses, and maybe whether they're attractive or not. And then the facial recognition system is once, so when we look at the, after the training, we look at what's deployed and this system can be broken down into these three components. Uh, for, so facial detection, uh, facial normalization, and facial matching or recognition. The detection part answers the question, is there a face there? Uh, this is a picture, this is just a, a picture from my phone, a screenshot of my phone, uh, looking at some previous work that I made, which creates these artificial faces. Uh, it's kind of creepy looking to have this row of faces, but you can see that the camera recognizes these faces. So whenever you use your smartphone to take a picture and uh, look at the view uh, coming through the camera and see this kind of box that appears around the faces, that's the facial detection part. So that's totally separate from the recognition. It doesn't know that that's some particular identity. It just says there's a face there and outlines it. And so the facial detection phase discovers there's a face here, takes that picture, and then passes on this kind of sub-image. So this uh, rectangle would be cropped out and passed along to the next phase. The next phase of normalizing uh, estimates landmarks. So it would say these are parts of the face that are important um, around the nose, the eyes, the mouth, points that are interpreted as significant, and then that facial image, so you know, when you have a picture of someone, they might be like this, they might be like this. So you put the landmarks on and then re-skew their face to try to make it appear that it's facing forward even if it's not. And that's because generally the images that are used uh, for training are these kind of more perfect images that are facing front and are uh, uh, forward. And then the last part is the recognition or the matching, another picture from my phone. So you can see here that my iPhone has detected several of the uh, faces that I made in my artwork to be people, which I find really interesting. <laughs> so I have, you know, there's probably 50 different uh, fake faces that I've made uh, that are sculptures just of a head. They have no body attached to them at all. And these are recognized as people in my phone and often suggested that I might want to look at an album of their pictures uh, <laughs> next to my mother. <laughs> so in the recognition or matching phase, um, what basically happens is that a vector is extracted. Um, so a, a, a set of 128 or so numbers that are found to be uh, a significant way of representing this, this big image. So you might take a, a big image and just reduce it down to only 128 numbers from this sub-image. And the reason this can be done is because a, a neural network or, or a machine learning system was trained earlier on millions of images and through that process is meant to be able to generalize. So because this network was shown millions of images, maybe trained for days, as Zach was alluding to. The idea is then that you can give it one image or a few images of a person's face, and from that it can generalize and create this vector, this feature vector, and that should represent that person. So the feature vector, is uh, it's meant to be such that 
any picture of that person will produce a similar set of numbers. And then what happens is you just compare these numbers and you see is this set of numbers similar to this set of numbers and if they're significantly similar, it counts as a match. And that counts as uh, sort of behind the scenes in these systems. That's what means that a face is recognized, that it has a, a feature vector, a set of numbers that are similar to this set of numbers associated with their identity in a database. So this is behind the scenes. And so knowing these things, I mean, having been thinking about these things for many years, um, I find myself now increasingly thinking about being looked at. So I have um, you know, this phone now that has so many cameras on it. I have so many cameras in my environment all the time. And it becomes increasingly interesting me to think about what these abstractions of me actually look like. So these things that are hidden away inside of these structures. So how am I represented inside the structure of the system? And what other kinds of images might have feature vectors, might have these sets of numbers that are significantly similar to me. So I'm, among other things, a programmer, and I've been working with machine learning for a long time. And the way that I thought of to get at answering this question, or kind of moving towards an answer to this question, was to use an algorithm to generate pictures and then see if I could generate pictures that were recognized as me. And so this is what you see here is this process of evolution um, that's evolution in quotes, that's um, generating a population of images, then taking the images that are the most successful at meeting the goal of looking like me or looking like a face. And then it takes those most successful images, it crosses them together, it mutates them a bit and creates a new population. And that continues, and that continues So for hundreds of generations. And after hundreds of generations, you have pictures that are successfully identified either as a, a face, so detected as being a face, which is what you see here, or recognized actually as me. So I took this three components of the facial recognition system and pulled them apart and targeted the facial detection and the recognition part with these evolutionary algorithms. So what you see in this video here is the evolution of a population of images that attempt to be detected as a face. So maybe I can just show you a few of these detected faces. So this first phase of the project was just about facial detection. This was the first piece that I focused on. And the choice of black and white is because the color data is actually thrown out anyway. Uh, so it wasn't meant to be kind of like a, an artsy move. <laughs> it's just how the algorithms work, so the color data is not used. Here's two phases. So you get these kind of beautiful ghostly images and then sometimes, I mean some of you ho have seen the videos downstairs already know that sometimes you get also some kind of whimsical surprises like this. <laughs> and um, yeah, but what you see is that almost always what has come out of the process of facial detection is essentially a white oval. And so I'll come back to that. The next phase of this was looking at recognition, and so what we see here is a population of images that are trying to be recognized as my face. So not just detected as a face, but kind of jumping past that and looking at the recognition part. So looking inside of this black box, or trying to kind of probe this black box by throwing random pictures at it and seeing what is significantly similar to me. What are images that neighbor my face inside of this strange artificial intelligence system.
And you get pictures like this. So really foreign. I mean, I don't, I, tell me if I'm wrong, but I don't think anyone probably looks at a picture like that and can see any resemblance whatsoever to my face. <laughs> so it's a really different thing that's going on. And I think that invites us to think about what that means. I mean, what does it mean that we build these systems that have this so-called intelligence that is structured in a way that is so entirely unintuitive to how we think and how we experience the world. So I went into this project not knowing what I would find. Um, we, I was talking with Katrina about this for like a year and we've been uh, in conversations over the last months really as the results come out and we try to pour over them and, and think through them together and, and think also how to talk about them and communicate what's going on. Um, and I think there's two different things going on. So it's, there's two projects here within this, this body of work of how do you see me. And so the facial detection one, um, what does it mean? What is being recognized? What is being recognized is a generic face. It's a template of what defines a face to the facial detection algorithms. And this is actually I think really um, a very telling image. So we see that there is a stereotype that's built into the facial detection system and it becomes very visible and very clear in using these evolutionary algorithms to kind of excavate it and pull it back out. So in the case of facial detection, there's this very clear political problem at the core of it. With facial recognition, it's more complicated. And it's not as easy to talk about it. It's not as easy to think through. There is something going on that's maybe more poetic, maybe aesthetically more interesting, I don't know. Um, but we see a feature vector that neighbors my own. And we have to try to make sense of that somehow. So, what I think is that by seeing images and maybe by seeing many, many more of these, I mean, this is just a, a beginning perhaps, I could generate millions more of these and we could look at them and, you know, maybe after millions in, of, of goes at this, there might be a picture that would look somewhat like me. You might um, put together millions of these and then see this whole spectrum of images, some of which would be my face and some of which would look nothing like me. And you can use that to think about what is internally structuring these systems and what does it mean to give authority to systems that have such an entirely different way of seeing, of seeing us, of seeing the world, that have this kind of knowledge that is not making any sense to us. So, in conclusion, I think it's interesting to think about representation uh, in this context as well. So this is something that I wrote a bit about uh, for the Photographer's Gallery for the Unthinking Photography blog. Um, like last summer, I wrote an essay called Generative Representation that looks a bit at this. Um, but basically, artificial intelligence is built on models. And models are these very kind of slippery constructs so a model is a reduced description of a complex uh, real-world system designed to fulfill a certain function. And in machine learning, a model is an artifact produced through a training process, as we've been discussing, as it's exposed to data. Uh, but within the context of AI, I think it's important to acknowledge that, that the model makes this implicit claim to perhaps represent its subject. So the face model claims to identify what a face is, even if it couches that in uh, degrees of certainty or uh, accuracy. It makes a claim of the essence of faceness. And it's immediately clear when we look at this picture what faceness is to the model. And so 
as I've been describing, so it's not an abstract essence of a face, it's a stereotype. And so we have to be cautious of this tendency to see models as objective representations and rather see them as framing identity through a particular lens, through the particular lens of their experience of the data. And then we have this thing that's perhaps more interesting and less obvious and less intuitive to grasp and that's this maybe multiplicity of the subject. So because the feature vector, the abstract representation, has so many neighbors, there's so many pictures, images that are so, that neighbor my, <laughs> neighbor my face in this space but are so vastly different and so alien to human experience, this concept of similarity, I think, has to come into question. So we're used to thinking of representation as a reduction of similar elements and in the model, we have something that feels like representation because it works sometimes, but the similarity of the represented elements is totally unintelligible. So the rule by which the category is constructed is out of reach. And so I'd maybe like to leave it at that and invite Daniel up to talk. <laughs> 